for that. Um, you can stay up to date with our information on the SEI Philly website. Normally we have a post at least for the upcoming month, and then you can reach out to us at the email on the screen there if you have any questions or concerns. So this is the board for this year. These guys put in a lot of hard effort in order to get us good presenters every single month and then also do a lot of engagement with the community, including students. So I really appreciate everybody's hard work. You know, it's a group effort for sure. So thank you to these guys. And then we want to put up our previous year's golf outing sponsors. Um, you can see them on the screen here. We had a really successful golf outing last year that each year helps give us support in order to give Philadelphia area students scholarship money. Um, we were able to give out um, $3,000 in scholarship money this past year and are looking forward to doing that this year too. So this upcoming May, we should have another golf outing and we're looking forward to these companies being represented and you know any additional companies too. So just within the past month, we had a student cornhole tournament held at Widener for the Philadelphia area schools. Um, it was a good, a good, uh, exciting event. You know, we ended up giving the first place and the second place teams their own cornhole boards, which are, you know, pretty high dollar value. They're really nice um, and got to network with some of the students there. So you can see the group group photo on the left. Um, so to today's webinar, um, please mute yourself when you're not speaking. And if you have questions um, that you want Gregor to address at the end of the presentation, please put them in the chat window. We'll have about 10 minutes in order to address those questions. And um, at the end, you know, if you can't get it in the chat quick enough, you can always unmute and discuss or ask the question that you're looking to ask. Um, so to today's presentation, it is on the design and construction of the Blenner Hassett Island Bridge and network tight arch. Um, <clears throat> So today's speaker is Gregor Wollman, uh, PE, PhD, a structural engineer with HNTB. Gregor is a structural engineer with HNTB, where he does a lot of design and construction of complex bridges. He grew up in Austria, went to the Vienna University of Technology, and then University of Texas at Austin, where he got his PhD. And he's a distinguished alumni from UT Austin. So welcome, Gregor. I'll uh, pass it off to you now. I think you're on mute still. I am sorry. All right, yep. let me let me get started. So I, I came into the US in 1986 thinking I'd be here for one year and I'm still here. <laughs> there you go. So um, this year is 15 years um, since the first network tight arch bridge was opened in the United States. Uh, um, and I thought I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about the history of network tight arches. And um, I will focus on the second network tight arch that was open because I didn't work on the first one. Uh, so we missed it by by one year, but at least it was the it was the longest span bridge in the world at this time of, of this type of network tight arch. And, 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 what, and so this is the Planahasset Island Bridge over the Ohio River between um, Ohio and, and um, uh, um, um, West Virginia. And um, it's a network tight arch which is characterized by this um, set of inclined cables that cross each other at least two um, um, locations and the simple variation of a vertical tight arch makes a huge difference as, as you will see um, as I as I go through this presentation. If you get the urge to visit the site after this, it's an easy six and a half hour drive um, from Philadelphia to Parkersburg, um, West Virginia, and you can you can see in this uh, slide if my marker comes back. Is a point to here we go. Um, uh, it was a, it's it's an important link for West Virginia. There's uh, Interstate 70 to the north and and Interstate 64 to the south, but there's really nothing in between. And this Route 50 I mean, is part of what they refer to as Corridor D in West Virginia. That was uh, that's a big uh, transportation link, an important transportation link in West Virginia. 
in Parkersburg um, and the Blennerhasset Island Bridge was kind of the last uh, link um, in this in this corridor uh, after I forgot how many years, but 20 or 30 years of, of construction. Um, so Blennerhasset Island is this island in the in the Ohio River and it has a, a great historical significance. It used to be the home of an Irish aristocrat by the name of um, um, Harmon Blennerhasset. So he had this mansion um, on the uh, east side of the island and the bridge location is on the on the west side of the island going both over the main channels and the north is the main channel and the south is, is a back channel. The, the history um, of, of this island is, is kind of fascinating. So, so Harmon Blennerhasset was an Irish aristocrat and he came, um, he had to leave Ireland for two reasons. Number one, he was over, uh, accused of, of trying to overthrow the, the British crown as an Irish freedom fighter, I guess. And the other reason was he married his niece, which was very poorly received in very Catholic Ireland. And so he came to the Ohio Valley back when this was frontier area and 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 uh, uh, constructed this 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 really magnificent mansion. So this was uh, in the late 1800s. So Philadelphia, to get you the the connection, um, was the capital of the United States from 1790 to 1800, while the White House was being constructed, and uh, and he got himself in entangled with the. Burr conspiracy. And if you think politics is crazy nowadays, it was apparently even crazier back then. So Aaron Burr was um, the vice president of the uh, United States back then, and he got in a tangle with the, uh, the Treasury, Secretary of Treasury, Alexander Hamilton, and then ended up killing him in a duel. And, uh, and then later on was accused of of trying to start his um, an, an, his own empire around the Louisiana region. So and Lana Hassett got entangled by that. He gave he gave Burr some some room for for anchor his fleet on Lana Hassett Island, and uh, and so he got in trouble for that and ended up returning to Ireland where he died in poverty. So uh, needless to say, the, there was a lot of concerns about the, the historic about the historical um, impact on the of the bridge on the island and, and a lot of constraints. And for the longest time, um, we were not even allowed to touch the island, neither in the permanent structure nor during construction. And so the scheme that we actually advanced to 60% design was this suspension bridge with a 1380 foot main span, which is kind of a ridiculously small span. Um, if, if I put the Ben Franklin bridge up in comparison, so that's a 1750 foot span. Um, and I won't get into this now, but at the end of your time, ask me how you get um, the, the, the bridge deck over the island without actually touching the island. Um, so they went, as I said, we designed this to 60% completion and they built this model that was that was um, displayed in the courthouse in Parkersburg. Um, so for a structure engineer, it was really exciting because on one hand, uh, it's pretty cool to design a a suspension bridge. You don't get that opportunity a lot of these days. Um, but on the other hand, I felt really bad about designing a, a bridge that really didn't make much sense. Um, and so again, so the reason was they really didn't want to touch the island, both because of the historic significance, uh, not only the Blennerhasset Mansion, but also um, they found some uh, Native American artifacts dating back 9,000 years right at the bridge site. And Probably the most important reason, um, DuPont has a plant nearby, and I think people expected this to have become a secret dump site for, for chemicals and, and uh, hazardous waste, uh, which turned out not to be the case. So we had a change in governor and and uh, and, and we, we changed uh, direction um, and went to this, this arch uh, arrangement. And so here's what we came up. So this is this is just the main span over the over the um, over the navigational channel and just to identify some of the elements. So it's a tight arch, which means we have this tension element that catches the thrust that the arch delivers to the tie. The deck sits on top of the tie beam. We have the arch ribs, we have an upper lateral bracing. And then I mentioned earlier this, this network hanger arrangement. Um, 
this was in the early 2000s, and this is when I discovered Google. I guess it's not Google SketchUp, so, but it's SketchUp, so a very simple 3D drawing. And so I had fun um, reconstructing the, the bridge. Um, and it's a good opportunity to identify the elements. So this, 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 is, this is the main span, the main pier. And I don't know, I'm always blown away as, as a structure engineer. You sit at home as a designer, you sit at home and look at the 11 by 17 sheets and it all fits on 11 by 17 sheet. And then you go out on site and you see how huge these structures really are. So here you have two guys for comparison. So this is the pier. Uh, this is a bearing for the for the arch of so these tiny pieces of the bearings. And here you can see the, um, uh, the those are wind locks. So the next element is the is the deck steel. So those are the ties. And then we have the in interior floor beams and the end floor beams. And this is a region is what we call knuckle joint. And so those are 80,000 pound P, um, elements um, where the arch rib, the tie girder, uh, the floor beam, the end floor beam comes in and where the bearing uh, uh, sits underneath the tie girder. So those are very complicated elements. They're actually quite tricky to design. Um, then the next level is the... <laughs> Sure. The next level is uh, an upper lateral bracing, excuse me, the lower lateral bracing. And in this case, um, normally this lower lateral bracing, I'm not sure if you can see it, uh, we actually put it in the in the level of the upper flange of the floor beams because this bridge had a very large span, 107 foot span, and we needed the bracing also to brace the floor beam again for, for lateral torsional buckling. And then on top of that, we'll, we'll put the stringers down. So here the stringers sitting on the on the floor beams. Then we have the arch ribs, the upper lateral bracing. And then finally, the network cables. And then uh, we place the bridge deck. Just looking at some dimensions. So this is a 878, 878 and a half foot span. Back then, was it was the world record for network tight arch. In the meantime, the Russians have blown that out of the water with the bridge to nowhere in Siberia. That's like 1,200 feet, also network tight arch, but it's still the second longest in the world. Um, you can see uh, uh, back, uh, this was when high performance steel became more popular. So we used it uh, grade 70 for the tie. This is a tension element, so it makes sense. Um, we stuck with the 50 grade for the rib because this is very much controlled by um, plates land on this limit, so it didn't make sense to go higher. Um, this happens to be a parabolic arch rib, which, which makes sense for um, traditional arches. For network tight arches, we actually have some room and some liberty, uh, but we, we tend to go with the newer ones. We tend to go with cir um, um, circular ribs. Um, and the other interesting feature is the cable arrangement. You can actually vary these and optimize the structure. So in this case, they're fairly widely spaced cables, 62 feet. We tend to go um, shorter these days. Um, and we made these all parallel. Um, but again, you have uh, um, some, some room to play with these. These, these network tight arches are quite um, um, open to variation in shape. So I promise to to explain the the really the stunning advantages of this network hanger arrangement. And so to do this, I want to compare um, a, a scheme with vertical hangers and the scheme with network hangers. And, and what you'll see is some um, analysis comparisons and they're only the, the two structures are completely identical. The only difference being that with the network hanger arrangement, I took the cables, split them in two, and declined that at 60 degree angles. And arches are really efficient under uniform loads, so um, self weight, um, but they kind of struggle when you have unequal loads. And that's, of course, mostly live loads. So live load or half a span really creates some troubles to, to, to arch bridges. And to show the advantage of networking arrangements, we're going to compare these two systems under that live load case, that half the spend live load case with vertical hangers and the network hangers. Now, the other concern um, is the behavior of the, uh, or the redundancy of the system. In particular, um, uh, uh, the tie is crucial 
to the um, to the performance or to, to the stability of the structure. Imagine this acts like um, um, the bow in, in bow and arrow. And if we lose the string, the bow will kind of snap, snap straight and, and the bridge would collapse. So, so this is what we call a fracture critical element that ties a fracture critical element um, in, in bridge engineering. And so I want to show a comparison. What happens if we lose um, just part of the tie? We cannot afford to lose all of the tie. That that still leads to collapse. But what happens if we if we break a portion of the tie um, with the vertical hanger system, the network hanger system? And we had something like this happen quite recently, sort of um, uh, May last year, in the, and under the so and under the Soda Bridge, um, which is a tight arch. And this is the tie. And it lost. They lost half the tie. This, this, the Mississippi River was shut down for, for several days because this is such a crucial element. Um, um, so, so this is this is um, kind of a tie damage scenario. And then the comparison analysis, I represent this just as a, as a hinge element. So we can still transmit axial force across that fractured section, but not bending moments. So let's begin with deflections. Again, this is under that life load over half a span. And you can see with the vertical hanger arrangement, we get 36 inch of deflection. And with the uh, network tight arch arrangement, we get one tenth that. This is actually what drove us to considering the network hanger arrangement. We wanted to get these deflections under control. So exactly the same steel quantities, 10 times the stiffness under life load. Um, now, if we look at the bending moments, and again, this is that critical load case where we have live load over half the span. Um, you can see at the top, you get fairly large bending moments, 32,000 kips in the tie, 22,000 kips in the rib. And then in the lower portion, we now have introduced that, that, um, that hinge to uh, represent a damaged tie. And if you compare the numbers, a lot of that force actually gets shifted to the rib. So now here we have a um, what we want to be a slender element in compression. Uh, so bending moments, they get magnified. And you can see this dramatic shift. It almost doubles the bending moment in the arch rib when we lose even partial tie capacity. Now in contrast, remember these numbers, 22,000 kips, 32,000 kips. So now if we go to the network hang arrangement, uh, we have about one quarter of the bending moment um, in the with the network hang arrangement. And then down here again, we introduced the, the, um, the hinge here, so which we'll have to represent that fracture tie. And you can see there's no change in bending moments. As a matter of fact, it actually goes down a little bit. And this can be explained by um, uh, this network hang arrangement really approaching a truss like behavior. So with with trusses, also the, the, the cords, the bending moments in the cords are mostly due to compatibility and they're not required for equilibrium. And, and so this network tight arch system approaches this truss like behavior. Um, so when we started out working on this, this was roughly 2002, 2003. And we started looking at this um, network hang arrangement. I, I was I was really concerned because I, I knew about this bridge, um, the Fehmarnsund Fe bridge in, in northern Germany. Uh, and that was the last time a network tight arch was was constructed, at least as far as I knew at the time. Uh, and then so you can't help to wonder what's wrong with this system that that it hasn't been done for 40 years. Um, I did end up find a paper on the analysis of of this of this uh, of this structure back back in the in the 60s and late 50s, and they didn't have the computational capacities back then. So somebody spent three years, uh, you know, just just analyzing this and and doing um, um, uh, stress optical tests, building models to get a handle of the forces. And nowadays, with our computational power. Um, but they but took them three years back then. We could we can now do in in, in a week. Um, so that was what that I took that as as that was my comforting th thought of of why why that's not being done the system and not something inherently wrong with the system. But you do see we, we, you will see some some challenges. Um, the, the cables end up picking up higher loads and 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 higher fatigue forces. So that's something to. Um, 
uh, watch out for. We talked about uh, fracture critical elements, so the ties of fracture critical element. Uh, and this is for the bridge engineers, you know this. For the building engineers, you don't have that concept as far as I know. But a fracture critical member is defined as an element or component that is subject to um, tension to, uh, and, and where the failure of that element would cause collapse of the bridge. So that's something we are very concerned about and we try to avoid. And so with these network tight arches, what we tend to do is to build them up of multiple plates. So we like these box girder systems. Um, we build them up of plates and instead of welding that box together, it's actually bolted together. So you can see here the, 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 the bolted connection. And then the design actually assumes complete loss of any one of these plates. So we're actually designing this for an entire web missing or entire flange missing. Now, the importance of that bolted connection, you can see here, this is going back to that Hernando de Soto bridge where they had a welded box. And you can see the box, it actually, the, the, the fracture goes all the way down one of the webs. It goes a little bit into bottom flange. It goes all the way to top flange. And then fortunately it did not continue propagating it. It actually um, broke the longitudinal weld. So that bridge was held up by maybe 40% of the original cross section. And so, so we're doing two things. Number one, we design it for missing one of these plates. And number two, we, we provide a detail that does not let the proper the, the crack propagate through the section. Um, the other interesting design aspect is accidental hanger loss. So we designed these structures for not just one cable missing, but actually the cable being removed suddenly. So you have a dynamic effect. So so which which you can in a static equivalent um, uh, approach, you apply a force opposite to the original cable force. So that's a very unpleasant load case. And um, the Post Tensioning Institute, PTI Post Tension Institute has recommendations for the design of cable supported bridges. And they say um, that you must um, provide 100% impact. So not only do you miss the cable force, you actually apply the opposite cable force at 100% at on the arch rip. Um, we tend to do a dynamic analysis, um, and then usually that 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 hundred percent impact becomes quite conservative, and and depending on cable spacing and and arch rip configuration, we tend to become much less, even less than Planner Hassett was in this range, but often we are like in the forty percent range of dynamic impact. Um, I mentioned so this this this. Um, this accidental hanger loss moment is a, is a rather unpleasant load case because it it, uh, it 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 if you remember we had six thousand kip feet so now we double the bending moment in the arch rib um, under this extreme event. Um, so here's a dynamic analysis, uh, and and this is this is quite a severe case. Um, this is this is a different bridge. This is a railroad bridge, and um, in in this rendering I took out the front uh, cable plane. The cables are actually there. Um, it's just for for show, so you can see more clearly. In the back, we've actually taken out three cables. Let me stop the. Maybe I don't stop it. Um, let me go up. It's still, yeah. So in the back, we actually removed three cables: one, two, and three. This was a railroad bridge. This is portal bridge, um, which is currently under construction. Um, and. And so in the dynamic analysis, you begin with applying the cable force as an external force, and then you then you remove these cable forces suddenly. And uh, it's it's rather simple. I mean, we, we have beautiful um, our computational power these days. So this is this is not terribly difficult to analyze, and and we make sure that the structure can withstand um, this kind of arrangement. So not just one cable, but but even two cables or three cables, if they're sufficiently spaced sufficiently closely. Um, looking at the um, the cross section of the floor beam, this is kind of old school. We don't do this much anymore, but on Blender Hassett, we did it this way, which is having the deck supported on the floor beam. So it's kind of a floating deck. Um, we have stringers running above the floor beam. It's sitting on on, on neoprene bearings. And so the deck is completely separated from the tie system. And this was, um, the intention was to, to keep the deck out of the, um, the tension load path. Um, so this was an owner preference um, 
so so that that uh, we don't pick up too much tension in the bridge deck. And for our later bridges, we usually make um, the deck composite with the floor beams and make it composite with the tie girder because that buys us an additional redundancy. Um, we end up post tensioning the deck and, and provide a ton of reinforcement. Um, so that's the disadvantage, but uh, uh, it has advantages in, in terms of, of floor beam design redundancy. Um, so talking about floor beam design, so with these um, non-composite floor beam, uh, there were two issues we needed to address. Number one was, uh, I mentioned it was 107 foot between centerline tiger, so that's a long unsupported length, and we needed to address concerns about lateral torsional buckling. Uh, particularly with that top loading, that's actually not quite right in, in Ashto. If, if you look at the equations in Ashto for lateral torsional buckling, um, they assume that the vertical load is applied at mid depth of the girder. But if you apply the top depth at the top of the girder, that actually increases the, 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 the destabilizing force. So we did two things. We, we applied this floor beam that braces, it's not you can see it here, but it braces the floor beam at mid span. And then we actually connected the floor beam um, for weak axis bending and strong axis bending, of course, um, with the tie girder. And, and the idea is that this connection braces uh, it against weak axis bending, and it also eliminates some of the uh, cracking that we often see with these type of, of trusses and arches. What we often see is, is due to incompatibility between tie beam of deformations and stringer rotation and lengthening. Often we see cracks along the floor beam to tie beam connection would be cracks running underneath the um, the top floor beam flange. And, and so those were both two measures that that we took to prevent this, these kinds of issues from happening. Now the interesting part is the lower hanger connection. So we, we uh, wanted the um, the connection to be inside the floor beam. And so we have these transverse anchor beams, and then we use, um, and I'll come to this later, but we actually borrowed uh, technology from cable state bridges where you have um, single strands and they, they run through a guide pipe and are then anchored inside the floor beam. So that way the anchors are nicely protected. The anchors are nicely protected um, by, by using these single strands, they're easy to install, but we had a lot of explaining to do back then what happens if you need to adjust the entire bundle. And so this is the rendering where we showed, yes, you can uh, get uh, an anchor into the box. This, this, was a large, this was a large box, like four feet by six feet. Um, so we said, yeah, you can fit it geometrically. Uh, I, I don't think we ever adequately addressed the concern that these things weigh at least 500 pounds. So, so there's some uh, there's some challenging associated with getting these these uh, these anchors into the box, but it can it can be done. Uh, you have to have a special uh, uh, stressing scheme. So here's the rendering and here's the actual um, uh, uh, structure. I lost my. There we go. And this is the upper hanger connection. So a similar scheme. We have this, these transverse cross beams, and then the anchors are, are um, sitting on this anchor beam. So four foot wide, five and a half foot deep. So back then we were cautious with size with sizes. We've now done some some of these where the tie beam um, and the rib are just four and a half feet. That's about as small as you can get and, and still be able to, to get into it and have people inside the tie girder. Now I mentioned we used a, 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 a cable system that we borrowed from stay cable bridge technology. Hmm. So instead of having a single large diameter rope, um, this system comprises a, a number of these monostrands. So the monostrands are, 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 are made of seven wire strands. In this case, we use 27, 0.62 diameter, so that's 0.23 square inch. And each of these wires is about a quarter inch in diameter. And the, the metal is, or the, the strand is encased in a, in a PE sheathing that's, that's actually tightly extruded. And before that sheath is extruded, there's also a, a wax or a grease. 
So we have multiple layers of corrosion protection just for this element by itself. There's, there's the grease, it's layer one, the sheathing is layer two, and then the whole bundle uh, resides inside a plastic um, HTPE uh, type. So we have three layers of corrosion protection. This is this is this is kind of the standard solution for cable stead bridges. The transition to the anchors is a little bit uh, tricky or involved. Um, so what you see here is that the strands layer out. They then extend into this anchor box and each strand is grabbed by individual wedges. And so this transition uh, is, is where we need to make sure that our corrosion protection system is not compromised. Uh, so these, these anchorage devices are subject to insanely uh, severe testing. They get tested in fatigue. And then they have this nasty water tightening, tightness test. So what you can what you see here is the anchor. So here's the strains coming in. This is a, a, a cylinder with with a thread or a tube with a, a thick tube with a thread. And this is um, a, a ring nut. And they can adjust the ring nut to adjust the length of the bundle. Um, this this uh, teal color is a wax, and that's the it's a cap. So this whole assembly is submerged for three days under 10 feet of of water, uh, but they put this nasty liquid dye. And after 10 days, they they remove the they take the structure out or they take the test sample out of the of, of that tube out of the 10 foot um, pipe and make sure that no dye has penetrated down to the anchor component. So it's a really uh, stringent test that the structure will never see in real life, but that's the kind of the demand that's made on these on these um, stay cable anchorages. Um, let's talk a little bit of, about construction. So here you can see the planner house at island, the main span with the arch going up, and then this is the the side span or the back span where we have two piers in the water. Uh, there's a there's a bridge uh, that that provides access to the island. Um, and this one, now the contractor assures me this this uh, crawler crane was was first used for construction of the Panama Canal. And I'm not totally sure if I should believe it. They tend to pull your leg if you're going inside as your engineer. But it's a it's a it's a huge crane, and they needed that uh, because so we have about 60 feet of clearance underneath the bridge, and then it's 175 feet rise. So so it's about 200 and uh, or was it 200 and 40 feet to get to the to the top of the arch that so they, they needed this crane for the reach. Um, so here's the the backspan system. So they had an interesting arrangement. There was a requirement that the backspan remains open during construction. So they could not uh, uh, have a trestle bridge just across. So they started out with having heart rate trestles that get you just to these um, pier foundations here. So you see the foundations. This is uh, interesting too. So these are drill shaft casing and you have a template that's used to guide the um, sheet piling and in the background you can see the sheet piling is, is already in place. So they have the trestles to, to work from that and then attached to the trestle, anchored to the trestles are these two barges here and then in the middle they have this drawbridge. So, so in case that somebody wants to take their boat across the back channel for some reason whatsoever, that be able to pull up the drawbridge. So the contractor told me they never actually had to pull up the drawbridge, uh, which I don't quite understand because if I was a boat owner in that area, I would have sailed down the back channel all day long just to see the drawbridge going up and down, see how it works. So here we see the uh, the construction uh, of of the of the of the piers of the of the backspan. Piers, so they 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 pump pump uh, concrete. They use these these uh, trestles for the approaches, and uh, so that the system worked really well, except during the winter when there was ice build up on the Ohio River, and and, and the bridges created a barrier to the ice. Um, that was easily uh, fixed, though. They all they had to do was swing the barges out and then let the ice pass. But that looked pretty impressive. Uh, uh, with the ice uh, uh, bearing on the on the on that trestle bridge, um, the next two slides. I, I, I like this slide when I when I teach a a, a concrete seminar. Uh, 
This is everything you need to know about post-tension concrete in, in one slide. Uh, because they, they use this post-tension pier cap. So what you have here is the rebar cage is, 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 is ready to be dropped into the pier cap. And so these are the, the, um, the ducts for, for the post-tensioning tendons. They use to form a void in the concrete. So we drop this in, place the concrete, and then they install high strength steel, uh, similar to the uh, stay cables or the stay cable strands into this duct. And then they're stressed against the concrete. And you can imagine uh, uh, as you as you as you uh, stress the strand, the the the, the stuck wants to straighten out, but it can't. So it pushes down on the concrete here, and it pushes up on the concrete here. And conveniently, the location where it pushes up is between the piers, and the location where it pushes down is is over the the the, the column, the pier column. Um, and so that's what's called load balancing, the post tensioning deviation force actually balances the weight on the on the um, bent cap. This is the installation of the strain. So they install this strain by strain, recognize this strain similar to the uh, the stay cables comes off this reel, um, except this one is not coded uh, it, it, because this is grouted by the by the time it's done. Um, and then in the end, we have to stress the strains against the concrete. Just to give you an idea about the uh, the forces that are involved. Uh, so this is a 19 strand tendon. You get about 50 kips out of each strand. So we're, we're getting close to 1,000 kips that supply it over this tiny bearing plate. That's about a one square foot of of bearing area. So you do the math. Uh, so the design of these these anchorage regions is is usually a, a big concern. So so 1,000 kips. That's that's uh, uh, 12 fully loaded trucks that are sitting on this one bearing plate. Um, so um, the, the approaches on this structure were no slouches either. I, I was mostly in charge of the main span. I used to make fun of my colleagues uh, uh, that there's a pier missing. This is a 400 foot span with a parallel steel plate girder, 10 foot girder depth. Uh, so so quite quite a, a aggressive design. Here you see the um, the Panama Canal crawler crane placing the approach span girders and with a 400 foot span you get pretty good uh, uh camber so this is 15 inches of camber so these girders needed to be uh designed with with significant camber because it deflects so much during concrete placement which creates interesting challenges too because the exterior girder girders want to deflect differently from the interior girders um, you have to be careful that that you account for that properly um, and uh, the uh, the DOT were really pushing us to, they, they like the stiffness. Normally we try to avoid longitudinal stiffness, but they like the longitudinal stiffness. And you can go to some crazy thin uh, web web thicknesses. So so if you, I think without trust in the calculations, I'd be concerned about this, these dimensions, but it, it, it turned out okay. So here you can see the, the structure during during um, erection, and 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 so the erection is challenging too. So particularly here, they 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 had these long cantilever stages, uh, which you know worked on paper, but the structure is unbraced and it's a little bit susceptible to wind loads. So we had this uh, this uh, event here it was it was a fairly moderate wind. I don't I don't think not even forty miles per hour, fifty miles per hour. And so you can see these these uh, uh, these girders got excited a little bit. I'm not sure if you can see it, but uh, it's probably a six foot amplitude, three foot each way that these girders uh, swayed in the wind. The, the contractor claims that they had um, a guy wires down. I don't see them here, but uh, that was supposed to prevent this from happening. The, the girders did OK. We had to replace a lot of bearings to, to um, address this concern to address this, the aftermath of this event. Uh, talking a little bit about tight arch construction. So this is what we call stick building. They actually built the arch directly um, um, on onshoring um, in the river. That's where you kind of um, driven to with this super long span. Also nowadays we would probably, um, this is a big one, but if they're smaller, you can build the entire arch offshore or, or offsite 
and then float it in, which we've done a few times. But this one was that was stick build. Uh, so here's the support. These are these are um, steel casings. The bottom part is filled with sand, uh, and, and there's there's heavy coal barges going down the river. So I asked the contractor what they do with with impact, and so they said they carry good insurance. So so, so uh, there's really not much you can do if if this gets gets impacted. So that that's one of the disadvantages of of the stick building. Um, so they made, they they built this in in two halves. So you, you can see uh, one half, and they actually offset the whole structure about six inch um, uh, to the to the direction of the land, so that when they build the second half, that they could be assured that that the, that they would come together correctly. Um, one other interesting aspect, if you kind of try to visualize where's the center of gravity at this stage, and it's just slightly forward over this forward support. So so the whole arch actually wants to pivot and rotate off the, the rear supports, which in fact it did. So they had this tie-down system. You could actually see there was daylight underneath the bearings. They, they had this tie-down system, but they had backup tie-downs in case the main tie-down system uh, uh, would fail. But this is a pretty precarious state, right? So the structure is sitting on the front, on the, on the forward supports and has the tie-downs. Uh, that's when the barge got away and with the crate. So you can see the uh, the barge um, impacting or the crane impacting the bridge. Uh, the contractor were very upset about the crane boom. I was much more concerned about the uh, the the uh, the structure, but it 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 did very well. No, very very little damage. I think one stringer needed to be replaced, but. Uh, um, so, it, so it held up really well under this load testing. So here we have the second part just going up. Uh, so this one is done. You can see the bracing system. It's, this holds the cantilever. There's, there's, there's two struts. These struts were quite amazing. Uh, and I'll have a slide on that in a, in a moment here. Uh, and then here we are approaching um, our closure. Uh, they did have a slight problem. So at this point, you want to actually I said we had this deliberate six inch gap. So at this point, they actually want to slide the um, the, the arch strip that was constructed um, off, off its permanent condition. You want to push that in. And um, uh, this had sliding supports here, but instead of sliding on the support, it turns out uh, it, it, it didn't slide. It actually deflected the, the whole um, casing. And so I, I, had, I had this vision of, of, of um, Coke cans buckling, these really thin walled Coke cans. I mean, this was one inch um, wall casing, but we still didn't want it bent. So it took about two weeks until they figured out that um, this this tie back that had post tensioning strand, but they didn't, they hadn't uh, stressed the strand. Uh, I guess they had too much seating losses. And and so this was not stiff enough. And, and after that was re-stressed, um, this worked flawlessly. Mm them to make the closure. And then the final exciting stage is to 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 close the ribs. And this is interesting too, because you have to deal with with match up. And um, and they did this to open the gap with these with these struts. At, at, and so they had a scheme here where the struts could be adjusted to, to very precisely to I mean, less less than an eighth of an inch. And what you see inside here is this this um, yellow jacks uh, and when you inflate or deflate the jack uh, they they have um, uh, uh, screw screws so they, they have um, uh, nuts screw nuts uh, to to adjust the, the length so they, they they were able to adjust this very finely um, took a three-man crew so here's your friendly strut adjustment crew he runs the pump and these two had to turn the nuts and that's not an easy endeavor this these were like two and a half inch diameter rods with the knots and hard to get to um, but it worked really well um, and so they got the arch strip successfully closed and then of course you have to come you come out on site and uh, who would not want to walk the arch rib right so it's a it's a little bit scary um, but you have all six degrees of freedom tied off and so so i of course walked up to um, uh, uh, and uh, 
and then you make it to the top and i was super proud we made it to the top how brave we are and then you see these guys uh installing upper lateral bracing and so they have these very sturdy work platforms uh, installing bolts so i asked the contractor if they you know at this point we're 275 feet over the river and i asked the contractor or 250 feet over the river and asked the contractor if 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 I can show these slides because uh, you know this, this, there must be some OSHA violations, and he looked at it, so it's like nope they're all wearing their hard hats so 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 you're good. Um, so now coming uh, so the final stage is the cable installation. So in this case that's done by just lifting in one strand and the duct, and then you can once you got the the, the pilot strand in you can then just install one strand at a time and also stress at the one strand at the time. So it's super simple. And uh, and uh, so here's the structure. Um, the arch is done. Uh, they're getting ready. You, you can see here the concrete pavers getting ready. That that green is the epoxy coated strand. So this is just awaiting uh, uh, the concrete placement. It's, it's a beautiful site except for the cement plant here. But it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really nice looking bridge. There's a, there's a beautiful overview when you drive down there. Um, and then so opening was June 13th, 2008. So second network tight arch in the United States. Uh, I was actually really nervous because there's, there's so many people on that bridge. It's like, I hope it holds up, but it's been doing okay for 15 years now or 14 years now. And we have really embraced this, this network uh, hang arrangement. So so this is just h and bridges in the United States. There's one more in Bahrain, but these all, network tight arches that we have designed and, and most of them have been constructed. Some are currently um, under design or other construction. Uh, and they, they, can, they can cover the whole range of pedestrian bridges. These are pedestrian bridges. This is a concrete network tight arch that was just opened in, in uh, uh, Los Angeles. Uh, we have uh, railroad bridges, heavy loaded railroad bridges. So you can really cover the whole range of, of, of bridges. They all have their interesting uh, uh, challenges. So this is Happy Hollow that's in, in San Jose. That's a 270 foot pedestrian bridge. The arch rip before the cables are installed has a slenderness scale of R of 700. So that, that creates some interesting uh, installation challenges. This is a, a scheme we like a lot these days. That's the Lake Champlain Bridge. Uh, it was opened in 2011. This is one where the bridge was actually fabricated onshore or, uh, or and then barged in and then lifted uh, into a precision. This is Video Bridge. It was opened in 2015, the first span in 2018. Uh, um, and this one portal bridge is currently under construction. So this is going to be the first time, I think the first one ever using designed for Cooper E80 uh, 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 railroad bridges. This one I'm having fun with right now that's currently under construction. So this is a uh, um, network tight arch with a skew and curved deck. And so one of your questions in the question answer section should be, how do you get a tension tight arch to work when it's curved. And uh, this one is, is uh, the currently designing, this is Susquehanna River, so this is gonna be another railroad bridge. And I mentioned how much you can play with the shapes and with railroad bridges, we're struggling with fatigue and there's some advantages to, to do this, what looks slightly crazy uh, cable arrangements, but by flattening these end cables, you really help with the fatigue uh, stress range, and by steepening these cables, you you um, you help with 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 um, keeping enough tension in the cable. So that's always that's with network tight arches. Um, uh, uh, controlling the cable force is maybe the the biggest challenge. So because on one hand you 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 pick up more stress range than with vertical hanger, because they act just like truss diagonals. Um, so I this is well stop. I have more slides, but uh, this is well stop to give your give us some time for questions and answers. If I can get to them right now here, um, here's my email, gwalman at hntb.com. You can also feel free to, to email me. So let me try to stop the presentation here if I can figure out how to do this. Here we go. 
Uh, thank you, thank you, Gregor. I appreciate it. Yeah. Yep. Um, so I'll kind of ro roll through the different questions that are in the chat, and we can address them. So to address the PDH, the link was put in the chat. So please just go to our website, and then you can click on a link there to download the PDH. Um, first question is, who is a contractor on site? Uh, the contractor was Walsh, Walsh Construction. OK. Um, second question is, did you make the tie girder box larger just to allow more room for inspection around the anchorages, or were there other constraints? So I'm six foot four. I like to have room. <laughs> <laughs> no, but but so so in 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 truth, uh, the the connection between the the floor beam and the tie girder. If I go to that slide, is is much easier if the floor beam and the tie girder have the same depth. Makes for a very simple connection. And because we had this great width, uh, it, it made sense to make the tie girder the, the same depth. Uh, uh, with with smaller spans, that the smallest tie girder I've seen is is uh, the Lake Champlain bridge, which is a two uh, two lane bridge, a, a very small bridge, and that tie girder is only four and a half foot deep. And the width is the width tends to be almost always four feet or three and a half feet, uh, because uh, that's what you need for the the rib. The rib picks up quite a bit of bending moment, and you need a substance in the in the in in that in that for 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 wind load, and and so that they, they tend to be in the three and a half to four foot range, and then you make the width of the um, the tie grader the same. It's also necessary. You can see we like these diaphragms, and then you have have certain opening width for the diaphragm, and and that also dictates the 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 box width. Awesome. Um, so we have your one question parroted back is how do you design a tide arch with a curved back? <laughs> so I'd be interested in hearing that too. That's curved. <laughs> yeah. So that's this one here. So th this is a super interesting system. Uh, let me go here so I can scribble on it. Um, into my scribble. So what, what we actually have here is which screen am I sharing? Let me let me just share my um, that arch. So number one, uh, uh, this system has floor beams. These are all floor beams here, and uh, so you can envision that the concrete deck and the floor beams together form a truss. So these are the truss diagonals, and the floor beams. Uh, uh, and the concrete, so there's, there's this this diagonal members are kind of form themselves inside the concrete. So that way you actually have a truss. It's not just a straight tension member. And the other trick that's not shown here is we're actually running straight tendons from end to end, and they fit just between. So they they clear the. This is kind of our backup load path. We like redundancy. So the primary load path is through the ties, the floor beams, and the concrete strut. But if all of that gives out, um, the ties, the, the post-tensioning tendons are designed to, to take out all of the out of the thrust. So, so we, we like redundancy. Usually these tight arches, we have I don't know, three times as much axial resistance than what we really need. So could you describe uh, the launching system in order to miss the island in the initial scheme? The launching, yeah, OK, so so you, you, you mean the. the uh, With the original suspension cable, yeah, the, I think. Oh, oh, that one, yeah, OK, that was the one yep. of the questions I told you you need to ask, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, OK, I like to do this when I when I do this with students, they usually are shy as I tell I, I planned questions for them. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I, I call it the Tarzan swing, so we were not allowed to let me find it. We we're not allowed to touch the island. Uh, let me do this one here, so the idea would be to. So, so these these cable stay or these 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 um, these suspension bridges are usually if here's the cable. They usually um, actually erect at one segment at a time. So, so you, you put the next one up, the next one up, or, or maybe, uh, and so they already designed one segment at a time. And and so the question is, 
how do you get the segment on the island? So normally you would, you know, if this was over a river, you would just drive your barge underneath and then they have a crane that's sitting on the cable and the crane picks up the segment. So the Tarzan swing scheme is, is here's the cable. And so, so here's the, you know, the cables, they're already pre-installed. And you hang a, you hang a segment here then you have a long cable pull it over so it so it does this and then you so then you hand it over to the next set of cables and then you do the same thing so so you have this you have this condition here where you where you have the where you have the segment being pulled over so it can grab the next set of cables i'm kind of glad that they uh ditch this scheme because this is all very theoretical. I mean, this has been done before, but not for, you know, maybe for two or three segments and not for the entire span. OK, great. Um, all right, so two more questions. So the roadway alignment is not perpendicular to the river flow, and it looks like it was an altogether new alignment. What determined the alignment? You know, so I'm a structural engineer. I was given <laughs> this. <laughs> I, was, I was given this. It's like, why in the world did we even go with that island? Why didn't we just move down a little bit <laughs> where we don't have two channels? Um, so I, 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 I so the, the short answer is I don't actually know. Uh, I, I guess they tried to miss the the plant here. Uh, um, there's, there's, there's. Uh, um, some some residential areas, so, so there's there's you want know, you want to do as little land takings as possible. So that's my very thin answer here. Yeah, no, understood. <laughs> yeah, and then the final yeah, we, question. We, we, what... handed the, we, we handed these things right. It's like why did you curb <laughs> that bridge? <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. And then uh, the last one is some of the other bridges have arch ribs that lean together, but Blenner has it the ribs are parallel. What is the purpose of tilting the rib versus keeping it vertical? Yeah, so um, tilting is super efficient as far as wind loads is concerned. When you have them vertical, you you actually uh, pick up a lot of of um, of wind loads. Okay, let me go pick that slide. So so um, let me go like like video. We did the same thing. Uh, find video here. Yes, video. So video we also kept them vertical. And you can imagine if if you if you tilt them, we call that a basket handle arrangement, uh, you eat into clearance. We need to get trucks underneath that portal opening. And so you need a fairly tall bridge or you need a fairly wide bridge. Uh, my, I saw somebody here from Baker. Uh, they they made this this bridge much wider than the deck to to be able to use um, a tilted arrangement. That 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 tilted arrangement is is really nice. Or that basket handle arrangement is super efficient um, for wind loads because you you instead of having just a frame for the portal, um, you you get. You know, you get kind of a component of your arch rip thrust actually takes out the wind load. So, so that that's a nice arrangement. It it looks better. Um, um, you know, you have less upper lateral bracing. Uh, it's a little bit harder to construct. Um, sometimes you might be concerned about um, if if you're going for kind of a parallel cable look. But this is something I, I love on Blender Hassett. Is is uh, you have this parallel cable look, right? Um, and you you lose that even if you make the cables parallel by the time you 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 tilt one arch plane in or well, the arch planes in the, the parallel uh, view gets lost. Uh, but if the bridge is narrow enough or tall enough, that basket handle arrangement is quite effective. Um, if the bridge is wide, uh, it's usually a geometric constraint that prevents you from from doing this. So you can see here this one we have. Uh, Three lanes, a wide shoulder, a load path, and if you if you would lean that in, it it, it just it just uh, it doesn't you just don't have room for that. Oh, awesome! I don't see any more questions, and we really appreciate the presentation today. I know I learned a lot, and it was very interesting. So thank you, Gregor. Yeah, thank you. Um, so the upcoming events, you know, in January. 
we're going to have Kirk Harmon presenting um, at the end of January, hopefully out in Valley Forge. Um, and then we also obviously have our golf outing in the spring of 2023. And for a speaker gift today, we'll send you, Gregor, a few SEI golf balls that we have. Um, so we'll get them to you one way or another. Even if you don't play golf, you can use them in a well, put them on oh, desk. So, 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 so my wife has a championship ring when she, when she won the championship with, when she played for the University of Nebraska. There you so, go. So she's a big golfer. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> I'll pass it up to her. <laughs> well, we'll definitely send them then. So thank, yeah. thanks again, and uh, I really appreciate your time. Okay, thank you. See you guys.